be reading for Matthew 16, 21 to 28. Um, from then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hydrants to, my, to me because you are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what will benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange of his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in his glory of his Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as an elder and one of the pastors. This morning, I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you. This morning, we start a new series um, titled Real Talk. Real Talk, according to the Urban Dictionary, is the philosophy of talking candidly, openly, and honestly without fear of what others might think. Real talk is also used to let someone know of something that may be hard to speak about or something hard that is coming. So allow me to take off my socks. I promise my feet don't smell. My wife can vouch for that. So allow me to take off my socks and fold my feet on the couch uh, or stretch my feet onto the Ottoman coffee table as we get real this morning. As a church, sometimes we need some real talk to ask the hard questions and resolve to finding practical biblical solutions that bring about real and lasting change. As a church, we long to see transformation in the lives of our people. We long to see our people grapple with life and to flourish. Some of our real talk themes include bad sex, good sex, money, 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 to name a few. This morning, we start with the theme, don't waste your life. And we focus on Matthew 16, verse 21 to 28 to unpack this theme, to get real. What is a hashtag? The Cambridge Dictionary describes it as a symbol hash on a phone or a keyboard used on social media for describing the subject for a tweet. It can also be something that groups a particular idea or groups of ideas. You can expand that definition to a label which purpose or identity is formed. So popular hashtags would include hashtags like living my best life now, besthashtags.com will show other popular hashtags if you ask for a specific label. So if you ask for life, you might get hashtags like living, my li living life my way or hashtag living life to the full. If you search hashtags linked to life, that's what you'll get. These hashtags are used to express purpose, identity, and maybe even belief. So living my best life now would accompany images, would be accompanied by images of perfectly placed food, um, selfies, latest travel destination, or the latest purchase of an iPhone house or car. Living, my, living life my way is normally accompanied by images of people doing extreme activities, um, traveling, people doing sports, uh, and a golf, weightlifting, um, maybe even some people eating sushi. Um, that's what you'll see if you look at that hashtag. If someone were to ask your best friend or someone that's close to you, what is your life's hashtag? Something that best reflects you. What would that be? A Christmas Carol is a book by Charles Dickens, which has an adapted movie as well. So A, a Christmas Carol is about redemption and transformation as its main theme. So Scrooge, the main character, is portrayed as a character consumed by greed, indifference, and bitterness. He has dedicated his life to accumulating wealth and has neglected the value of human relationships. Scrooge is visited by different ghosts, past, present, and future, showing him parts of his life 
actions and consequences. Scrooge realizes that he has squandered his life in pursuit of material wealth at the expense of experiencing genuine human connections and at the expense of true spirit of Christmas. There's a transformation as Scrooge sees or experiences these three uh, ghosts of different seasons. He sees that he's wasted his life, that he's pursued material wealth and being self-centered. A Christmas carol encourages readers to reflect on their own lives and consider the ways in which they may be wasting precious time, neglecting important relationships, or failing to find joy and purpose. If you consider that Scrooge was wasting precious time, that he was wasting his life, what should have his life looked like? What should our lives look like? What should be our hashtag? This morning we'll see the world, social media, and how we live should show the true purpose and identity of our lives. We will see this morning that Matthew has a different perspective of what loving life means. Matthew has a different perspective on what living my best life is. Matthew doesn't want us to waste our life, but rather to have our lives hidden in God. Three points this morning. Jesus, a life of sacrifice. What is a life wasted and a life well lived? So some context to understand where this passage fits in. We are a gospel-centered church after all. At this point of Matthew, Jesus has already started his ministry. Matthew 5-7 to is the first big sermon that Jesus delivers as he starts his ministry. Jesus announces God's kingdom, speaks about how to live in this kingdom through the most popular sermon. The Sermon on the Mount moves to transform hearts for God. Jesus in chapters 8 to 10 sends out the 12 disciples whom he has called to follow him. Jesus heals, teaches, and calls more people to follow him. In chapter 13, Jesus teaches about the kingdom through the use of parables, which are like stories used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. And there are three primary reactions to his teaching and parables. There's positive reactions. These are people who believe Jesus is the Messiah. There's negative like the Pharisees and scribes, they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. They expect a different kind of Messiah, a different kind of person who's coming to overthrow the government. Neutral, those who aren't sure and maybe asking the question, is Jesus the Messiah? Chapter 14 to 16, we see Jesus continue to teach, to perform miracles. And specifically in chapter 16, we see Jesus ask his disciples who people think he is. The disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, Others, Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Verse 15, Jesus asked them, who do you say I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus responds, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Jesus then predicts his death based on him being the Messiah, the one who came to save the world, the one who came to redeem God's chosen people to himself. So let's look at the first point, Jesus a life of sacrifice. Verse 21, from then on Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. So from then on, the start of verse 21 is a phrase that signifies a change from that moment in time and a change that continues as a result of what has happened before. So because Jesus is the Messiah, which the disciples are starting to believe or starting to grapple with, Jesus then predicts that it is necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, that it is necessary for him to be killed and be raised the third day. What is the significance of the Messiah? Or what is the significance of the statement that Jesus says in verse 21? In Genesis, we see the creation of the world we see sin enter the world through disobedience from Adam and Eve. Genesis 12, we see Abraham in the promises of God, that Abraham will be blessed and his descendants will be made into a great nation. And this comes through what is credited to Abraham as righteousness. Through the line of Abraham and through the Old Testament, we see an experience from the prophets that there is a Messiah, a savior for the people of God, one who is coming to redeem the people of God. His name is Jesus, who brings the forgiveness of sins. And as we continue thinking about the overall Bible, series, Bible story, we see the perfect birth of Jesus, born of a virgin Mary, lives a perfect life, meaning a life of perfect obedience, a sinless life, because he is God and fully human walking on earth. Before Jesus, there was a constant sacrifice for sin that was needed, 
The people of God would bring sacrifices to atone or to ask for forgiveness of sins. This was a regular occurrence of bringing sacrifice for sin. Because Jesus is the perfect ultimate lamb as he is spotless. No sin in him. And we see that in 1 Peter 2 verse 22. Jesus then is the perfect sacrifice once and for all, for all who believe in him. In Matthew 16 verse 21, Jesus is alluding to his death. He has to suffer, but importantly, that he will rise on the third day. As Jesus is saying this, you get the sense of complete focus, of complete awareness of of his death, which is necessary. He's aware of the nature of his death. He would suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and he would be killed. I want you to consider the extent to which Jesus here is speaking. To consider this gruesome death. Jesus was bound with his hands joined at the back under trial. Jesus is blindfolded beaten by the guards that were guarding him. Jesus' face was bruised and swollen as a crown of thorns was used to place over his head. The crown of thorns creates a deep cut near his brow, which gets deeper and wider as they continue to beat Jesus. More beating would be used to punish Jesus. This would include a whip which has lead and stone on it. With every hit, the Savior's skin would tear. His back and legs have open wounds as they continue to beat him. Jesus carries his own cross. This cross would sit against and rub the already open wounds. This cross is heavy. This cross beam where Jesus would be using it to to, to carry the cross would weigh about 45 KG, that sounds light, but consider that the whole time he's been beaten and consider that the whole cross is about 130 degrees, 130 kgs. And Jesus is dragging and carrying this cross on open wounds as he was beaten repeatedly. So his strength would be weak. Consider the shame of all the people watching, scorning, spitting at Jesus. He would carry his cross all the way out of town to where they would crucify him. The cross is laid down and Jesus is nailed down with nails one centimeter in thickness. This is slightly bigger than the size of your most visible tooth, which is the incisor. It is likely the same width as that of your nail, the nail of your pinky, if you were to look at it. That's the width of this nail. The length of the nail used are about 5.9 inches, which is about 15 centimeters. This is around the same size as your phone, if you have an average size Apple phone, um, not the ones with cameras, but an average size Apple phone, this will be around the same length as your pinky all the way to the edge of your wrist. These nails would be driven through his hand till they went through and into the cross beam. Many of us know some cuts to hands with a knife, some slammed fingers or hands in a door. This is another level of pain as they hammer this nail, not once, but multiple times to get it through and into the cross beam. They drove nails through his feet, which are placed one on top of the other. They lift the cross beam, which would cause pain to shoot through the body. The weight of his body on his hands, which cause paralysis in the chest as the hands are stretched out. Jesus would need to pull himself up and use his feet to prop himself in because of the pain. And every few moments, he would slip down. And as he keeps moving up and down, there's some relief to either the hands or the feet or the chest for breathing. Because he would not be able to hold himself in that position the whole time. So moving up and down would relieve some pressure. But as he moves up and down, he's still got this wood and beam at his back. The pain shooting down his back. His back rubbing across this cross beam. This whole process of moving up and down to lessen the pain, this excruciating pain, lasted about six hours on the cross. Jesus at one point says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus did nothing to be forsaken. Jesus is innocent. Jesus had not done anything to face the separation from God. We did. 
Jesus took our place on the cross. Isaiah 53 verse 4 to 5 says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We deserved to face that pain and that separation from God because of our sin that separates us from God. But Jesus, in his mercy, takes our place. Jesus was set on what he needed to do. Jesus knew that he would suffer. He knew he would, need, he would be separated from God the Father as he stood in our place on the cross. He was still committed to carrying his cross, committed to not wasting his life, and he rose again on the third day, conquering death because death could not keep him. He rose again. There is an actual empty tomb with a stone rolled away. I recently heard of a brother in the Lord saying when he stood at the doorway of this empty tomb in Jerusalem, emotion took over him. There's a real empty tomb of our real Savior God who died and rose again. This is a fact. So you have to keep this in your mind. We've spent a few moments looking at Jesus and his sacrifice for you and me. Looking at Jesus taking up his cross, being shamed, bruised, and hung on a cross for you and me. We have seen the love of Jesus for you. This is a love that should change us, a love that should transform our hearts and thoughts. We should desire to follow Jesus, to follow him wherever he leads us. Let's look at point two. What is a life wasted? As we have just seen the ultimate sacrifice. Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world, yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for this life? Like expressed in the Christmas carol, a life lived selfishly, a life lived void of purpose, a wasted, of wasted time is a life wasted. We see in Matthew that a life lived selfishly and a life lived on our own terms is a life wasted. I like how Matthew includes verse 24, which gives context to what a wasted or a saved life is. So verse 24 says, to follow Jesus, we must deny ourselves, our own self-centered existence. The word for is a coordinating conjunction, meaning because in this use of it. So Matthew is directly linking the losing of our life as denying oneself and following Jesus. Because if you deny yourself, if you take up your cross and follow Jesus, you find your life because of Jesus. Matthew is saying a life spent denying oneself and following Jesus is a life found, is a life well lived because of the truth of the birth, life, death, resurrection of Christ. And what Jesus is saying will happen, which is his death and resurrection. So verse 26b speaks about giving in exchange for this life. Matthew here is referring to paying a ransom for one's life to atone for that life. So Psalm 49 verse 6 to 8 says, they trust in their wealth and boast of their abundant riches, yet these cannot redeem a person or pay his ransom for God, since the price of redeeming him is too costly. One should forever stop trying so they may live a life forever and not see the pit. There is no amount of earthly wealth that can redeem us, that can be used as an exchange to save someone. Even if you gain the whole world, even if you create bonds to store all your treasure, even if you destroy those bonds, create bigger bonds to store more treasure, you cannot exchange anything for your life. Real talk. I know that many sitting here or listening to the audio podcast or YouTube are tired, tired of normal rhythms of life, tired of waking up early, having to work hard, the desire of your work and workload on your life. The desire of your family life is always there, and sometimes it feels relentless, like you have no break. Tired of the pressures that family, your extended family puts on you to do better, to be better, and to work harder. I know that some sitting here have real fears about the future, about the next job, about building a nest egg to escape the past you know. Some sitting here are drawn to the social media life that says it's all about you. Live life your way, the good life. If we are preoccupied and lost or entrenched in the wrong things, then are we really following that example of Jesus? I want to share a different perspective here. Fam, I'm not minimizing the reality of anyone's situation. There's real pain, 
There's real suffering. There's real fatigue and tired, but there's a different perspective we ought to have. Here's a quote by John Piper. Life is wasted if we do not grasp the glory of the cross. Cherish it for the treasure that it is and cleave to it as the highest price of every pleasure and the deepest comfort in every pain. A life wasted is a life spent hunting for the approval, acknowledgement, admiration of the world and social media and friends. A life wasted is a life spent filling up our existence with worldly comforts that seek to destroy and separate us from the true fulfillment in God. If you pull up your phone, what is the most used app? TV, social media, gym, golf, reading, all the self-help books, idols of work, idols of comfort, unhelpful friends or bad friendships, all the holiday trips, unhelpful cultural practices. What are you doing with your money? Is it helping you live the good life? What are you doing with your time? Is it giving you the feeling of my life now? These things are not everything. But if we don't live like we grasp the glory of the cross, if there are things more important than God, then these things are bad. So what is your priority? Where does the reality of the cross fit in? Where does God feature in your life? Another quote by John Piper, we waste our lives when we do not pray and think and dream and plan and work toward magnifying God in all spheres of life. Magnifying God in all spheres of life. We waste our lives when we do not pray and think and dream and plan and work toward magnifying God in all spheres of life. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Jesus turns and rebukes Peter for his different views. Jesus even categorizes those views as human concerns that are a hindrance to Jesus. Do we have human concerns that are wasting our life? Our last point, a life well lived. Philippians 2 verse 5 to nine shows Jesus' concerns. Shows Jesus' humility. Shows an example that we should follow as we follow Jesus. Verse five, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he came as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that, it in, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself and emptied himself in total devotion. If we are followers of Jesus, this is what we should do. We should assume the form of a servant. We should, we should be obedient to God, obedient to the point of death. A life well lived is a life spent following the example of Jesus. That is a life concerned with the things of God and not the things of this world. Verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father and then he will reward each according to what he has done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus Christ will return. He will return soon. When he returns, he will reward those according, he will reward uh, some according to what they have done. We should have a kingdom mindset. We should be focused on proclaiming Christ crucified. If we see the humility of Christ, his love and grace on the cross, we should proclaim Christ crucified. A life well lived is based on our worship of God in everything we do. Like Stephen said, our worship of God is not only singing in a Sunday morning, but it is our whole being. It is worship and living for God in words and using our gifts, our times, our talents, and using all of ourselves and our opportunities. Are we in relationship with God? A relationship is two ways. Do we hear from God and speak to God? Are we transformed by God and in turn bursting at the seams to share this great news? Or is all we are sharing about the things of the world? How is following Jesus changing you? Is this reflective in your working space? Do people know by how you live and the words you use that you're a follower of Jesus? How do you relate to those around you? 
both those who have less or more than you. It's Christ being seen in how you love your family. When Jesus returns, he will reward us according to what each has done. The rewards are a fulfillment of scripture. The rewards will show the reality of our life hidden in Christ. The rewards are fulfillment of eternal sowing and reaping. We don't work in vain, even though we work in response to the great gift of life through the cross. We don't work to receive salvation, but out of the awe and the grace of God, out of seeing the cross and experiencing the cross, we serve and we receive our reward when Jesus returns. As we close this morning, I want you to consider your life. Consider that hashtag. What would people think you are about? What will people say you are about? Will they say living life large? Will they say hashtag the good life? Will they say hashtag living my best life? Or they say hashtag Moreki, meaning the one who fills tables with joy, alcohol, food, and good time. What will they say? Would it say living for Christ? Will it say hashtag Somlandelo Jesu? Will it say hashtag Christ is risen? What will it say? Real talk. I desire to hear from Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. To hear this, we must be saved. We must believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. We must be obedient. Obedient to Christ to the point of death like we see our Savior Jesus Christ nailed to the cross in our place. And we must not waste our life. We must not waste our life. We need to be a prayerful people. We need to pray that God would continue to transform our hearts, that God would fill us with his heart that the things of this world don't consume us. We need to pray that God would lead us to love those around us, that we would be able to declare and live out Jesus as the name above all names. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit would be actively at work in us, conforming and changing us to the likeness of Christ. Is the Holy Spirit conforming and changing you? We must not waste our life. We must proclaim the gospel as followers of Jesus. That includes telling people about Jesus, inviting people to spaces where they can hear about Jesus. We must not waste our life. We must care for and love those around us. Being in community, doing life with others. Do you know what is happening in the life of those in your nearest proximity? Then how will you know to care for them? How will you be able to give and meet some of those needs? We must not waste our life. We must use our positions of authority to share the gospel and to change things for the better. What good is it if you work in a privileged position but never share Christ or seek to make a difference in the lives of others? We must not waste our life. A part of the transformation of our hearts comes in opening our hearts and letting our hearts be shaped by the word of God. Being in church is one of those ways. Being in the smaller expressions of community is another. Are you reading the Bible? Have you invited others to join you together, faithfully growing in knowledge of the word of God? We need to saturate our hearts and minds with God. Last quote this morning. If you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of your world of the world your soul is stuffed with small things and there's no room for the great we need to stop nibbling at the table of the world we must not waste our life we need to stop nibbling at the table of the world we need to spend time at the table with the father we need the holy spirit to make room for the father we need to commune with god the father we need to learn and be transformed by the father let us not waste our life but live our lives magnifying God in all spheres of our life. Let's pray. Our Father, blessing, honor, glory, and power be to you, Lord God. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open our hearts in wonder and show us who you are. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may the finished work of Christ sit enthroned in our hearts. May we experience the love, grace, and mercy of Christ as we remember his life, death, resurrection and as we wait for his ultimate return transform our hearts may we be more and more like christ may we be obedient to you lord god may we live lives that reflect jesus christ crucified for us by the power of the holy spirit may we not waste our life help us see where sin human concerns and utterances of the world choke our witness and move us further from you 
Lord God. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.